It's a pleasure to have Mike Smith from Carnegie Mellon University. Mike was scheduled to come last spring, and he was a casualty of the, uh, you know, scramble that emerged around our seminar schedule after the COVID uh, made us a lot less social. And uh, it, it's, uh, we're really sorry we had to do that, and we're, it's a great pleasure to have him back virtually, uh, apparently, to give the same paper he intended to give last spring. And uh, that, so we're not missing anything, and that's great. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, you know, Mike, take it away, and whenever you want questions or don't want questions, feel free to tell us, and, and uh, looking forward to it. Cool. Um, all right, so let me see if I can share. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, do that part, too. Do people see the slide? It's good. All right, fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to sell this as a as the, the delay as a feature and not a bug. Um, and it's, it's a feature in the sense that I, I think this topic is going to be easier to motivate now than it was six months ago. Um, but, but we'll see. So this, this is a, it, I'm used to giving seminars where I've got a bunch of data, I've run a bunch of analyses, I've got 45 backup slides with, with uh, you know, sensitivity tests, and my uh, uh, job is to spend the next hour or so convincing you that I know everything about this topic and my answer is right. Um, this is not that talk. <laughs> so this is much more of a, uh, a, a concept talk, if you will, about my belief um, that our business model is much more fragile than we think it is. Um, and, and, you know, and then thinking about what does that mean? Um, so I would love to have feedback particularly if you disagree with me um, on, on anything I'm, I'm about to say. I've been an academic long enough that, that I, I don't take disagreement personally. Um, that, so so that, that's A. The, the setup here is I, I, I've been thinking about this. I think I've got some things to say, but at the end of the day, I'm really looking for, for feedback on, on, the, on, on the concept. Um, the second thing is I'm going to try to take periodic breaks where we can sort of say, okay, let's, let's stop for a second and, and talk about this. But if, if you, if you have something, you know, pressing immediate, you know, if, if you feel free to jump right in, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with that as, as well. Does it, does that, does that make sense as ground rules? Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of motivate what I think is the tension here and then dive into a case study, if you will, of another industry that I think looks similar to, to our, current, our current situation, um, and then talk a little bit about what I think this means both for the university and also for us as social scientists. So let me, let me jump right in here by saying that, um, oops, there. Uh, by, by saying that just, just the statement that I think the higher, edu higher education business model is much more fragile than we realize is almost certainly wrong. Um, and, and so one of the exciting things about saying that is there, there is a whole wealth of, of literature that says that that's wrong. Starting with uh, someone who uh, uh, has an office very near to you. Um, so this is, this is Lawrence, Lawrence Bacow in uh, March of 2019 saying the death of American higher education as we know it has been grossly overpredicted and consistently so. Um, and you might argue, well, that's March 2019. Things have changed since the pandemic. Um, so here's a quote from Michael Drake, president of Ohio State at the time, currently president of the UC system, um, where he says, you know, he was asked right after the start of the pandemic, 
are you worried about the future of colleges and universities? And he said, you know what, I'm optimistic about universities broadly and the ability that universities have had to adapt to big changes throughout the centuries. And then he goes on to cite Clark, Clark Kerr's book, the uses, of the, the uses of the University, where Kerr documents the history of um, the institutions that he argues have survived in more or less the same form since the 1500s. And what he argues is of the 85 institutions that have survived in more or less constant form for the last 500 years, 70 of those 85 institutions have been universities. The remainder, if I remember correctly, were a few European parliaments, the Catholic Church, and a couple Swiss cantons, right? But 70 of the 85 are universities. Um, you know, why, why, would, why would today be any different? And you might argue, well, that was right at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, maybe, maybe now things are different. And so here's a quote, you know, a couple of months into the pandemic from Michael Roth, president of Wesleyan University, business school professors and technologists declare that college as we know it is over. We've seen this movie before and college has survived. it. Um, and again, as a business school professor who studies technology, you know, I, I find this kind of a kind of an interesting little little quote. Um, if I was a snarky person, I would say to President Roth, you know, maybe when your business is being affected by trans by, by technology, maybe business school professors and technologists should be the first people you talk to, not the last. But I'm but I'm not a snarky person, so I won't say that. Um, what I will say is, I think we have seen this movie before, right? Um, just in a different theater, if you will. Like in, in industry after industry, business school professors who study technology have looked at how technology changes market power. And just to mention a few names that you might be familiar with, you know, uh, 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 your, your, late, your late colleague, uh, Professor Christensen, um, Shane, uh, I, I use and regularly cite his Encyclopedia Britannica case as a great parallel to what I think we're facing in the university today. And then Eric and Andy and, and Fang have, have some very nice empirical work on this showing how industries that um, industries behave differently in the presence of technology than they did um, prior to technology. So, let me stop here and just and just say, does that setup make sense? Like, I think I think we have a really interesting tension here in the sense that you can make a perfectly reasonable argument that nothing's going to change about higher education because nothing has ever changed about higher education. And in fact, you know, at the turn of the century, we were told television would get rid of tech book, textbooks. Ten years ago, we were told MOOCs would get rid of higher education. Why should today be any different? On the other side, though, I think we have a whole literature of industries who said exactly the same thing up until the point where technology blew up power in their in their industry. Um, and so, you know, I, I as an academic, I, I that that's that's my motivation for playing around with this question. Does that does that make sense? Any objections so far? Have I pissed anybody off yet? Yeah, question question for you, sir. Which way are you going to go on this, Mike? Uh, uh, you know, the Britannic example is one of changes in revenue streams that are unanticipated. Um, and then an organizational structure that makes it challenging to respond. But you could also spin, spin a story of a massive change in the cost structure. Yep. Of delivery and, you know, that's, some, that's coming from there. Wh which way you sort of, can you outline which way you're going to go? Yeah, so the, these the kinds of stories only have so many different forms, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna selfishly use the a similar framework, and this is actually the next section. I'm I'm gonna try to apply the framework that I found most helpful to looking at change in the entertainment industry to our current moment. I don't think it's the only framework you could you could use. I mean, I think I think you know Clay, Clay's framework works perfectly well. I think Shane, a lot of a lot of what you said in Britannica applies here. Um, the one that resonates with me the most uh, is is just this notion that the reason. Well, let let me get to that in in a second because that's actually the next ten slides. Um, but the, okay. the, the, the framework I'm going to use, Shane, is is scarcity. Is that 
the, the reason the university has been so powerful is because we controlled scarce resources and digital technology does what digital technology always does, which is make things that used to be scarce plentiful and then create new sources of scarcity. Um, and, and we're gonna have, a, I'm gonna argue, uh, I think that's the core, the core function that's going on here and that's gonna make it hard for us to respond. Oh, but, but oh, okay. does that make sense? Yeah, I just, I'm just was thrilled momentarily that you were gonna compare me to an entertainer, but I guess not. Uh, I, I was, I was gonna say, you like me, you really like me. Uh, I, well, right. and, <laughs> and, yeah, and, I, and I, wanna, I wanna come back to this in a second because actually one of my colleagues has a really interesting book, or I'm sorry, really interesting paper about um, how the structure of the entertainment industry changed before and after vaudeville. Um, and his oh. argument is that when most performances were local, you had a fairly unconcentrated, um, you know, market for performers. You know, any any town you went to would have a bunch of local performers and a bunch of local local places mm -hmm. to perform. When the when the performance became virtual and easy to uh, broadcast, you ended up with with Tom Hanks. You ended up with winners and and losers. Um, and you know, I, I, again, I'll, I'll toss that out there as a potential model for, 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 for what we're going to see. Okay, um, I gotcha. Um, Mike, one, one quibble, at least like for me, the closest parallel to thinking about this is, is the, I, I remember the discussions around MOOCs and they were, I want to say equally dramatic. Um, I think you can find plenty of quotes, uh, it's very similar to this. Uh, when edX was launched and when Coursera was launched. Uh, but I wouldn't say that the effect of MOOCs has been very little. I wonder if there's kind of a more nuanced take on how MOOCs have affected uh, education today. Um, and then also like something about if, if your argument is around scarcity, I think having something around why one would argue that MOOCs also affected scarcity in some way. So is this just an amplification of that? And so I, I guess engaging with that in a deeper way um, might be uh, both productive and help us separate whether this is something different or not. Yeah, let me, let me, let me get to that um, again. In, in about 10 slides, I'd like to argue that there was, there was, there were some things, there were some things that MOOCs didn't provide that I think we're starting to see. Um, uh, so I, I think there is something different today about uh, that, that we're not seeing in the context of MOOCs. The other thing, and, and this, is, this is due respect to anybody who's, who's worked on um, MOOCs, but the, the other thing I'll argue is that when I looked at the entertainment industry, um, what I saw is that when they first saw technology, what they saw it as was a way to take their existing business model and business processes and just replicate them in the context of a new market. So they'd always sold DVDs, they'd always sold CDs, and they used iTunes as a way to replicate those processes. What they didn't see was Spotify and Netflix. Um, that, you know, sort of selling DVDs and CDs through iTunes wasn't actually that transformative to their business model. Um, Netflix and, and Spotify, I would argue, were. But, but let, let, me, let me see if I, can, if I can motivate that a little bit better for you, Abhishek, when we, when we get there. And if, if I still don't do a good job, jump in. Thank you. Sounds good. And any, other, any other questions on the setup? Mike, can I just jump in with a question? Um, Absolutely. So I, I apologize again. I know you're going to get to this, but I might need to get off earlier. The analogy with the content industries is something that that I thought you might resonate with. As, yeah, as you know, I'm probably sympathetic to. The, the one big difference um, over time that I've been reflecting on is, is this notion of excess demand. Meaning even if you can reach anyone you want to, is there a reason why you wouldn't open up the gates? Hmm. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, I mean, just as, you know Scott Galloway's analogy with luxury brands, which actually strikes me as quite relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I wonder which is the right analogy um, that, you know, questions of brand dilution obviously are so critical. <laughs> I'm not sure, and th this, this is part of the reason I'm really excited about you, you being here and you, you know, th th it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in 
areas where the analogy works well and areas where it doesn't work well. Um, I, when I think about the analogy, um, I think a lot about actually the, the students being in some ways the, the, the product, um, the content. Um, so I think one of the things we saw in the entertainment industry is that when we gave the ability to create content and the ability to distribute content to people, we discovered a lot of people who were really good storytellers and really talented, but just didn't fit into the narrow model of the old business who created wonderful, creative, entertaining things that we wouldn't have seen before. Um, I kind of conceptually wonder whether when we open up the doors to a bunch of people who just didn't have the access to the elite college experience, whether we're gonna discover people who are really talented, but just didn't fit into the narrow box that we were asking them to fit in um, to, get in, to get into college. And Byron, I, 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 don't know how you, I don't know how you respond to that, but I, I'd love to get your feedback on it. Sure, yeah, I'm glad to chat later. I mean, the question really okay. is more, you know, if, if Disney could reach a million people who are willing to pay what they, they offer, they will, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, what we've seen in the online space is regardless of how good a content creator you might have in the education space, the thing that the for-profit OPMs don't have is the brand, which is why they're all coming back to the universities. And so that's where yeah. the analogy, I, you know, I just wanted to push on that, but happy yeah. to, yeah, come back to it. Yeah, let, let me let me come let me come back to it and see see if I see if I see if I get there. Does that sound good? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So so let me jump into this this parallel, right? So for about the last uh, twenty years, um, my colleague Rahul Talang and I have been looking at uh, tech change in the entertainment industry. Um, and we've, we've looked at a lot of questions that they had about, you know, does piracy hurt sales? How should I change my windows? How should I change my prices? Very tactical questions. Um, and at some point we started to wonder whether, you know, this, this posed a threat to their business. Um, and, and one of the, you know, key questions, you know, one of the key quotes that I, that I use in class a lot is we had the president of home entertainment from one of the big six studios come and talk to our class, um, explain how technology was changing his business in 2015. And during the Q&A time, Rahul, my colleague, asked him, are you at all worried about the threat that Netflix, Amazon, and Google might pose to your business model? And he said, you know, this exact quote, the original players in my industry have been around for the last 100 years. There's a reason for that. And the, and the clear implication from the rest of what he said was, and that's not gonna change. Um, and, and what's fun about this, using this in class, is it's a, it's a wonderful mic drop quote, where you, know, you, you get students excited about saying, you know, how could somebody be so stupid to say that? And yet, you know, and yet you go, but the fact of the matter is, what he's saying is 100% correct. Same six studios dominated his business for the last 100 years. And it's not like the internet was the first technological shift they faced. They faced massive technological shifts in every aspect of how content was created, distributed, and consumed, and yet six studios dominated. Why was that? Um, the other fun thing about this is, you know, I think when, the stu when we talked to the studios about the major technological shifts that I would argue they were facing at the time, none of them looked like that much of a problem. You say, you know, the, we've, we've seen a rise in user-generated content, a rise of long-tail markets, digital, digital piracy, big data, and downstream platform consolidation. And when you raise those concerns to people in the industry, what you heard was user-generated content isn't a threat. It's all about cats riding uh, Roombas and cute baby pandas sneezing. It doesn't compete with the high-quality entertainment that I'm in the business of. Long tail markets don't pose a threat because my business is about selling lots of, lots of uh, uh, tickets, not selling a few tickets. Um, digital piracy, sure, it's bad, but it affects everybody in the industry equally. Big data, you can't use big data to make great, great entertainment. Um, and in fact, if you do, you're going to screw everything up. And yeah, there's been downstream platform consolidation, but they still depend on me for the creative content. Um, 
And so I originally titled this, this slide, Shameful Self-Promotion, um, but the, the, the truth of the matter is Rahul and I, you know, when we, when we heard that quote, we decided to go out and write a book that would try to answer those three questions. First of all, why do digital technologies pose a threat to leading firms in the entertainment industry? How is this change likely to play out in the market? And what can studios uh, and other entertainment firms do to, to respond? Um, I'll also say we've covered our advance, so I get paid a dollar sixteen every time somebody buys one of these. If you're looking for required text in your larger lectures, I, I recommend. It. Um, so, getting to the first question, why you know why do digital technologies pose a threat to firms in the entertainment industry? Um, if I were doing this in class, I'd write the supply chain on the board and you know, pose the question of why has so much power been concentrated in the hands of studios? And, and the argument we make in the book is that the, the reason for that is because the studios controlled three scarce resources. First of all, they controlled scarcity in the financial and technical resources that you needed to make content. They controlled the scarce access to the distribution channels necessary to reach your audience. And they were able to use artificial scarcity in via copyright law to control how consumers got access to their content. And that actually formed the basis for all of their business models. Um, and if you're following the logic, uh, you know, the, the, the next step is to say digital technology made all of those scarce resources suddenly plentiful and in the process shifted power, some power to artists, some power to channels and a great deal of power to consumers. The interesting one we argue in the book is the role of channels that, you know, the new scarce resource we would argue is customer attention. And none of the studios control customer attention in any of their existing channels. The people who control customer attention are Netflix, Amazon, and Google. And they're using that customer attention to not only promote content, but also vertically integrate into the content creation space. Okay, so let me let me pause here and and say, you know, any questions, any responses to that as a general framework. Quick question, Mike. Yeah, Abby. But when you hear the leadership of Netflix, they say we have two enemies. One is people going to sleep early. And the second one, which is more serious, is the rise of interactive computer games online. Yep shifting away from consumption of content. Yep, to a Is new format. Right in your opinion? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think that's right. And it's also a market that they would have, you know, thinking, about to, thinking back to Shane's, Shane's framework, right? It would, it would be a market that they would have a hard time entering because they don't have the assets necessary to enter that. Um, it's also a much more interactive, dynamic market. Um, which, is, which is another thing digital technologies do well that traditional broadcast technologies can't do. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Does that fold into the framework? Possibly. Did that answer your question, Avi? Cool. Other thoughts about this? All right. Um, so let me then argue, let me go back to these five, five uh, technological shifts. I would argue none of these poses much of a threat by itself, um, but the first three combined, I think, attack the old business model, the, the, the power that the firms, the entertainment firms had in their old business model. And I would argue this, the last two create a new business model that the firms just don't have any, any experience or expertise in. Um, and are going to have a hard time moving into. Uh, so one way to think about this and the, 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 uh, the, the analogy we use in the book is, you know, this, this is something like a perfect storm of, of change. Uh, the, the confluence of five shifts that make it hard for you to compete in your old business model and create a new business model that, um, that, that's gonna be hard for you to compete in. So if you come back to you know, bringing that back to, to education, maybe we could take this quote and tweak um, Michael Drake's quote just a little bit to say, I think he's saying some, somewhat of the same thing. The same universities have maintained power for the last 500 years. There's a reason for that, and I don't see that changing. 
Um, so what I'd like to play around with in, in, a, in a book I'm working on um, is those same three questions. You know, do, do digital technologies pose a threat to our business model today that we haven't seen in the past? How might this change play, play out in the market? And, and then what can we do to respond both as universities, but I'm, I'm gonna argue also as you know, economists, uh, social scientists and business school professors, can we use some of the same tools we've used to study change in these other industries to look at change in our own industry? Okay. Um, Mike? Yeah, sure, Shane. Yeah, just a, just a footnote. Actually, uh, uh, if you look at the modern university, which is what we're about to talk about, it's not 500 years old. It, it, it's, it's really the American version of it's about 50 years old, maybe a little older. It's a post-World War II uh, institution. So I just uh, not to be, a, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I was I was probably abusing Michael Drake's quote a little bit. Um, uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah, Avi. Okay. Uh, what do you see as the three big differences between Harvard, Yale, whatever now, and uh, 150 years ago? Is that a question for Shane or for me? For Shane, for Shane, because he put a, <laughs> we get a break, Mike. Bless you, sir. Uh, scale much larger dependence on funding from outside the dependence on the federal uh, research funding uh, the, probably the composition of activity is also rather different partially because of the outside funding and uh, Harvard Yale and Princeton don't have the characteristic I'm about to describe but uh, many other major universities do uh, in the U.S. anyway, which is that they're a major sport provider of sports, <laughs> and uh, uh, and, uh, and other entertainment. Uh, <laughs> that that's rather independent of the educational function. It's a rather different. Right. Yeah, I think, I if, think also if not negatively correlated. <laughs> yeah. I think another big difference is. Uh, Big, bigger and bigger part of reputation is research driven, not education driven. Oh, fair enough. Yes, that's that's. At, at Ab yes, I agree with that. And Abhishek also says the internationalization of the student body uh, is uh, that's even more recent than fifty years ago. Uh, uh, so, that, although there was a post World War II version of this in the fifties with a lot of World War II refugees coming to the U.S., so there was a version of that. Then most then, these faculty, I think, they missed. Yeah, but the, we get, that's a, it. Takes us aside. I just to, just to, just yeah. the footnote that I, I find your thesis very interesting, though. It's I, thinking about the modern American universities, in particular. But what you say, universities have adapted. Basically, what you yeah, say. Yeah, I, I, I will cheerfully con. You know, it, 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 let, let's acknowledge that universities have adapted to a lot of different changes. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to say the change we face today is no different than the changes we faced in the past. Um, I just, in the same way that, that when that studio executive said the same six studios have dominated my industry, it, you know, I understood the historical logic, but it, it, it felt different. Um, I, I, I understand the historical logic for universities adapting. Um, but the moment we have today feels different to me, and yeah. and I guess I'd like to put some structure on why it might be different. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Sure, sure I think you're next yeah. in the I, queue. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, I I have a question more about the who poses this threat in this, and and maybe it relates to sort of Abhishek's earlier question: Are we expecting this threat? to come from MOOCs or are we expecting this threat to come internally from our own efforts in online education? That, so so the, that's a great question. Let me, let me, let me can, I, can I hold that for three slides? Um, so, uh, sure. so again, if, if we have the same structure, the interesting question I would argue is why have universities been the source of power in this supply chain, if you will? Um, and, and let me argue for a second, and, and like I said, you, you can feel free to push back on this. One thing that makes sense to me 
um, is that we've controlled scarcity in faculty presence, if you will. We've controlled scarcity in access to classroom seats. And we've controlled an artificial scarcity in access to signals and certification necessary to uh, enter, the, enter the job market. Um, and, and if you buy that framework, and you don't have to, <laughs> but if you buy that framework, I think MOOCs rela relax the scarcity on the first two, but not the third one. Um, and I think we're starting to see some relaxation of the ability to signal your credentials to the job market without, necess without requiring a, uh, a university degree sitting behind it. Um, a couple examples I think of are Google saying fairly publicly that we aren't going to require undergraduate degrees for our um, applicants. And the reason we're not going to require degrees is that we've looked at our data and what we've discovered is where you graduated from, your GPA and what you majored in aren't all that predictive of your success at Google relative to the entrance exams we, we give you. Um, the other example I, I'm, I'm developing in the book is this wonderful story of this guy in um, Brazil who worked for the Brazilian state oil company and had, um, you know, uh, had graduated from the 13th best Brazilian engineering colleges in petroleum and petroleum and engineering. Um, and just so happened to like data analytics questions and get involved in the Kaggle data analytics challenge and was good enough that he rose to the top of the Kaggle leaderboard. And all of a sudden he was fielding job offers from Silicon Valley companies, again, not because of his degree, not because of his background, but solely because they knew he was good at data analytics just because of where he sat in the Kaggle leaderboards, okay? And again, if you, buy this, if you buy this structure, I think what this means is we might see a shift in power away from universities and towards professors, kind of like we saw away from studios and towards artists, some power shift towards students, and then, and then a potentially interesting power shift towards, towards em employers. The, the professor one, I, you know, I talk a lot about in class, right? After I've, after I've reviewed, you know, Shane's work and Eric Andy and Feng's work. Um, you know, it's when I talk about higher education, I point out the fact that, you know, would you rather learn about this from me, who's read Shane's work, or would you rather learn about it from Shane? Um, would you rather learn about, you know, the economics of, pi of, of, uh, of privacy from me or from Alessandro Acquisti? Um, you know, that could, could we imagine a world where that you know the the scarce the scarce resource of of the faculty in the in the room gets distributed to Shane and his expertise, Eric Brynjolfsson and his expertise, blah blah blah. Um, and could we could that kind of parallel the shift we saw in entertainment from a bunch of local markets to a winner take all outcome? The other thing, go go ahead, yeah. Just Stop. to interrupt, so I like the analogy with vaudeville versus uh, moving to kind of the, the superstars in production. But I guess another place where the analogy is a little fraught is in some ways we could think about education as a two-way street where we monitor how students do and we give them feedback and th those kinds of things are extremely localized. Um, so I guess like one argument could be we'll see like a decomposition of like con like one way content provision, and there might be other people whose job it is to like make yeah. sure that you're understanding or picking up what Shane is telling you on the video, or is there also good evidence that um, we can? I, I don't know. Like I I, I struggle with this. Uh, the two-way nature of education versus the one-way nature of watching movies. Yeah. And I wonder if that would limit some of these effects. It, yeah, Michael, uh, if I may jump in as well, I think what Abhishek just said is something that was on my mind as well, which is education, I mean, you're, I mean, you're kind of treating education as if it's content, but education is primarily a process uh, whose effectiveness is highly based on forming relationships 
So, um, you know, I'm not convinced that, you know, all of our team colleagues who originated great ideas are the best ones, uh, the best equipped to convey them, right? And in fact, if, if anyone is best, and it's what Abhishek said, it might not even be, you, you're, even, you're, even, you're even kind of thinking that this model of the professor leading a class is going to remain the dominant model of education, you know? So it's not necessarily artist-centric, right? Like an entertainment, right? It's, it's potentially a very, very different process. I, potentially. Let, let, me, let me make two points. Um, or let me, let me, so one, one point would be, A, I think that in some sense our business model is constraining our values as a business in, in some key ways, right? That in some way, the scarcity of faculty presence actually creates a really painful trade-off for us between personalization and efficiency in, in instruction, right? We know that students learn best in a one-on-one -on -one or small classroom environment, and yet, we cheerfully teach people in, in 500 person lecture halls. Um, you know, could we, could we come back to something more of, could we use technology to come back to something more of the benefits of mass market with the benefits of, of interactivity? Um, scarcity in classroom seats, you know, we as, and, and here are a couple of quotes that kind of highlight this, right? I think one of our key values as a university is creating opportunities for people. And it's kind of shocking to me that we measure our success by the number of people we exclude from campus. Um, you know, that, that the, you know, having a 15% selectivity ratio as a university means that, means that you've been successful. Um, and here are a couple of quotes that really highlight this for me. This is Jason England, um, who's actually a CMU colleague. Elite college admissions is at root a story of class warfare. It's not directly attributable to the fault of the deans. It's simply byproduct of the parameters within which the system operates. Um, this is another quest quote from the journal. Uh, you know, the v assistant VP of academic affairs at, at Florida State. If I'm gonna make room for more of the poor and minority students we want to admit, and I have a finite number of spaces, then someone has to suffer. Um, that in some sense, suffering is inherent to our, our, our model here. Um, I'd also argue that, you know, the, the way we do certification is, is kind of weird. Um, you know, that, that we don't tell people much about how, you know, what, what a, we know our students are unique, and yet we brand them with this really broad brand of you got an undergraduate degree in economics. Um, so that's, that's one thought on this. The other thought, and Chris, I don't know if you've played around at all with, where did it go? Um, that's weird, I lost the slide. I don't know if you've played around uh, much with um, uh, outlier.org. Have you, have you played around with outlier.org? Yeah, so, so Outlier is, uh, we, we did some research with um, the, we did some research with Masterclass, uh, and, and you guys are all familiar with Masterclass, right? Um, so the, the guy who founded Masterclass went on to start this new startup called Outlier that uh, has a set of classes, and one of them, one of them is Calculus. Um, my daughter wanted to take calculus this past summer. Her school said she couldn't take it because she hadn't, because she hadn't had pre-calc. Um, and so me as a dad said, well, screw you. We'll find a, excuse me. Um, we'll find a way to, to take that same class online. And we, and we took it from, from outlier and the way outlier is structured is that they actually if, if you're if you're interested afterwards go watch the trailer to the outlier calculus class and just munch on that concept for a second a trailer to a calculus class um, but the way it's set up is they've got three different professors teaching the same 15 minute modules on a topic using their own voice 
and and you take a you know a, an interactive quiz an adaptive quiz on on that topic and once you've once you've mastered the topic you move on to the next topic and the really cool thing about it is the three professors are Hannah Fry who is a professor at uh, University College London who studies the economics of happiness um, the second professor is John Urschel, who you'll remember as the former guard for the Baltimore Ravens and current all but dissertation PhD candidate at MIT um, in math. And the third guy is, um, oh shoot, uh, Chartier, um, uh, last name, anyway, guy, guy at Davidson College. Um, and what's, what's really fun about it, as I saw my daughter go through it, is they each teach in their own voice and with their own examples, like John Urschel, as an example of exponential decay, uses the uh, the the number the the fan base for the Balt for the Buffalo Bills over time. Um, uh, Hannah Fry to in to introduce natural logarithms uses uh, you know how much how much benefit you see from cleaning up your room, which for my daughter, if I if I could show you her room, is a very relevant metric for her. And it was just really interesting seeing my daughter who's the rising head of the Steminist club at her, uh, at her high school, you know, so Steminism is a thing, um, immediately gravitate towards Hannah Fry. You know, here's, here's a strong, successful mentor uh, in this space that I'm entering. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, you know, I, I don't know, just resonate with, with her voice. And then periodically check out some of these, some of these other professors. Like I said, I, I just, I wonder whether we could rethink the traditional stage on a stage model. Um, now to, to Chris's point, what do you do with the interaction? And the really cool thing about Outlier is they have a bunch of, you know, TAs in, in chat rooms who will help students with, with problems. And then they set up a community of other students who can bounce ideas off of, off of each other. Um, you know, and, and like I said, I found it to be very effective, um, for my daughter. And Mike, I, Mike, if I'm yeah. correct, you, you get a real credit. Oh, by the way, I'm the director of the digital initiative. I don't know if we've met. Dave, <laughs> um, nice to meet you. And if I remember correctly, you get a real credential from the school in your backyard. That would, that's exactly right. And in fact, that was, that was going to be my argument to my daughter's school is, you know, you're, you're telling me that she gets pit credit, but she can't have credit for for high school calculus, really. Um, we, we ended up resolving it before we got to that point, but, but you're absolutely right. You, you get real live course credit at Pitt. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and Outlier claims that they worked with F Florida Polytechnic University um, where some of the Florida Poly students took Outlier calculus and some took the in-person calculus and, and the outlier students perform better than the, than the, than the in-person students. Now, I don't think that's, I don't think they can make that claim causally after understanding how it was set up, but I think it's an interesting question. Fair. Okay. Um, Chris, I, I, do, do you want to jump in and did I, did I answer your question? I'm not sure you asked my question. In fact, now I, now that I remember what our outlier is, he is one of our graduates. And I know that he, before approaching Pittsburgh, he approached us for a joint partnership and, you know, we didn't, we didn't work with our leadership. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And in fact, if I remember correctly, one of your leaders was, you know, the, I think the current chancellor at Pitt used to be at BU or, or somebody. Exactly. So yeah. she, was, she was the dean of our arts and sciences and he formed a relationship with her. But I mean, that the outlier approach is very much viewing learning as a content industry, relying on superstar professors with Hollywood level production quality. So I'm, I'm not sure that this, this is the model that I'm looking for and this answer to the question. Plus, and the other thing that you mentioned, right, uh, which is, we don't have a reliable, and that's, that's one of the issues of the industry in general, we don't have reliable uh, ways of measuring the outcomes, right? We don't know whether this model, how effective it is, right? We don't know that. So you said it, it looks like, but yeah, it's, it's, that's one of the big issues of education. It's very much a black box. And, and I think it's, it's uh, you know, 
that's the reason why things are the way they are in a lot of in a lot of dimensions. That's fair, uh, but I, but I would I would say we don't have reliable metrics either online or or in person. Correct. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, m- make a comment here, Mike. My wife is a physician and. They have a tremendous amount of, so to speak, CME, continued medical education, okay? And 95% of it is done now with COVID, 100% online. And the way they get tested there, to answer Chris' point, there are testing centers all around the country when you come with your ID and, uh, or your passport, and they put you in an isolated cubicle, and they put a camera on top of you, so it's almost like a police monitoring and you get tested there individually. It's fairly expensive. You cannot do it with high volume. So there are some solutions to this uh, certification issue, but I can't say they're very pleasant for the students, but that's, that's how the industry <laughs> operates. As a physician, you must renew your license. So you have to go along. Yeah, I guess the, the, the only thing I'd say is the, the, the thing I'm thinking of for the future of higher education is far from perfect, but I, I would also argue that our current system of higher education is far from perfect, right? That, um, and again, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to step out of my, um, uh, uh, you know, business school professor role here, but I, we, we should be ashamed that we live in a world where my kids, I can, I can, pay money for my kids to take SAT prep classes that will make them 200 points smarter than they were two weeks ago. And the kids in the zip code right next to me don't have the same resources. And so we assume that they're 200 points dumber than my kids. Um, that's, that's, just, that's just wrong. Um, anyway, Any, anybody want to yell at me about that? Okay. Um, Here's the one that I find really interesting, right? Um, you know, could, could some of the power move from universities to some of these new online platforms who all of a sudden have detailed information about the individual student? And, and like I say, this, this is the one that, this, this is another parallel I see to entertainment, right? When you created a primetime television show, your goal was to create something broadly applicable to the center of the market. Um, And you had to wedge it into a 22 or 44 minute time slot. Um, When I enter a class of of 30 students, I feel kind of the same way. I'm pretty sure that 10% of my students are lost and at least 10% of my students are bored and I don't have time for either group of students nor do I have metrics on either group of students. I'm teaching to the broad middle of the the audience. Wouldn't it be cool if we could use data to do exactly what every other online company has done, which is create much more interactivity and personalization? Wouldn't it be cool if we could say, you know, Shane, um, you seem to be falling behind. Let's give you some extra review so so that you can master these topics. Avi, you seem to be ahead. Let's let's let you proceed ahead at at your own pace. Um, I don't think we've ever been able to do that, and um, you know I I think we might have the technologies that could allow us to do that with detailed information about about our students. Um, another thing I think about here is just the heterogeneity in how students learn. You know we. We know that not everybody learns by sitting quietly for 80 minutes at a time. Um, And yet we teach all of our students exactly the same way. Um, Wouldn't it be cool if we could adapt the, adapt the the medium to the needs of of the individual student? Shane. Yeah, so so, so listening to this conversation and and your your presentation, one thing that comes to mind uh, is is, is, and it's bothersome that you have one-way arrows. That's, that's been brought up. Um, uh, you, you know, if you were to think of universities as providing a matching function rather than an arrow function, a, ma- a matching of uh, providers of, I, I, I'm still not sure I'm comfortable with this, but let me just say it, providers of content with, you know, consumers of content, 
uh, and and there's heterogeneous providers and heterogeneous tastes. So it's uh, it's actually a matching problem. Then the arrows go in both directions. Uh, it, the thesis you're putting up here in that in that framing would would be by moving. I don't know, agency to the student, they get to choose how the match goes forward. I, I, I'm just trying to understand your thesis. And yet, and yet I have a, once I walk my way all the way through that, I, you know, I find that really awkward because it is two way, as someone said earlier, that um, there, you know, the guidance for better or worse does matter. Uh, Select, you know, opportunity, exploration, these things do matter. It's, it's not, it is a two-way street. It's not, it does go back both directions. So you're saying that um, an important function of the university is providing the guidance for students in what they should take next? Potentially in a sequence or bundle of, yeah, goods with uh, an understanding of what their goals are. That's a matching function. Yeah, you're right. Here's, so here's, here's, one, here's one thing that pops to mind, right? So um, Krishnan, for reasons that completely pass understanding, nominate, my dean com nominated me for the uh, leadership development program at CMU. Um, and uh, since this isn't being recorded, I can speak freely um, that, uh, yeah, I, I, I already intended. Um, so the, I found the course um, incredibly formulaic. It was, here are 10 rules for how to answer email like a boss. And here are seven things you should never say to your subordinates. Um, my wife was doing a leadership development class at the same time. And as I was complaining to her about it, she was like, oh, you should do mine. Theirs was much more, it was the first two weeks were all about who are you as an individual? What's your background? What are your needs? What are your goals? And then once we understand that, we can craft something unique for you. Um, I don't think we in the university today spend a whole lot of time understanding the unique needs of our students. I think we create a structure that is designed for the broad middle of the audience. Um, but when I stand in front of a group of, of, you know, 30 students, I can barely remember their names, much less their interests or their learning styles or their, or their career goals. Um, and even if I could remember those things, I'd have no way of customizing. So, so you're a, uh, having just been sold on the open curriculum of, 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 uh, of liberal arts, uh, institution and sent my daughter to this and I'm so I'm sensitive to this argument because I just shelled out a fair amount of money for, you know uh, bought into this one uh, right that's that's a skepticism about the open curriculum kind of approach to universities uh, the, the uh, one the one pause I have um, is the following as a, a junior in college engineering student I had to get a sociology breadth requirement. And I chose to take women's studies because honestly, how hard could it be, right? And about two weeks into the class, you realize, oh crap, there's a whole social structure that is disadvantaging a huge part of our part population. And I'm a part of it and I'm a real jerk, right? Like, I'm really glad somebody said, you need to take the sociology class to broaden yourself. And I'm pretty convinced I wouldn't have done it without that forcing function. How do we replicate that in this new world? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Again, since this is since this is, is being recorded, I can be I can be more blunt than I would be otherwise. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, just I raised the question. I don't have the answer to all the existential problems of 20 year olds. <laughs> well, and so here are the, I, I presented this to our faculty right before the pandemic. And these were sort of the objections I, I heard. Um, and, and honestly, I don't, I don't know that I buy any of them um, after, after trying to think carefully about each of them or I don't know that they're going to stop this change. I don't know that any of these things are going to stop these change, this change from happening. Um, 
And like all other technological changes, I think this is going to be good except for the parts that are bad. Um, you know, so I, I can see a lot of, you know, I can see a lot of downsides of this. I can see a lot of upsides for this. I just don't know that our current system of running up $1.6 trillion in student loan debt and systematically excluding large swaths of our population from access to the elite, elite college credentials, I don't know that that's going to work um, long term. Anybody, anybody want to? Yes, I have a question actually about this. How has the pandemic changed your perspective? Because I can tell you how it has changed mine given that uh -huh. we started teaching. So I remember the MOOC sort of fashion when I was a PhD student. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna find an academic job. Now I'm a lot more skeptical. And I am more so now that we're teaching online. The reason is we still haven't optimized teaching online, online teaching, and so that's, that's fine. Um, but in addition to content, in addition to commitment, sort of the social study uh, requirement, there's also a social and networking component yeah. that uh, cannot possibly be reproduced online. And so if I think, and to some extent I do, that the online experience provides the best way to deliver the content, I'm not sure it's the best way to absorb the content. Yeah, um, two, two thoughts, right? Number one, and I guess I should have made this clear right up front, Harvard's gonna be fine. <laughs> uh, one, one, of the, one of the interesting things as I've talked to people at various levels in the academic hierarchy is everybody believes that their school and everybody above them is going to be fine and everybody below them in the hierarchy is in deep trouble. Um, I don't know where the axe is going to fall, but there are going to be a lot of disappointed people, I think, right? I'm not worried about Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Um, uh, because I think there's, there's going to be a continued market for the brand name and the high quality professors and the on-campus interaction. Um, I just don't know whether there's enough of a market to support 5,000 colleges and universities in the United States. Um, what does that number look like? I'm not sure. Um, so there's, there's that one. There was something else you said that, that sparked something for me, and now, now I can't remember. Oh, the, the online communities. Um, I had a student, so A, let's, let's grant that whatever it is, 99 out of the Fortune 100 uh, CEOs graduated from Harvard Business School or whatever the right stat is, um, so that there is, there is a very strong networking component. Um, I had a student who wanted to become a product manager, and we didn't have a product management track, and she discovered an online offering called Product School, where Pro practicing product managers in the industry would teach the various classes. And then they would use, you know, there was like an online networking component of it where you'd network with these different product managers and different students. And she walked out of that saying, it gave me a great network in the product management community. It gave me a lot of experience. It gave me a great network. And I was able to use that network to, to find a job. Um, I'm not convinced that online, you know, online communities actually couldn't be a reasonably good replacement for the on-campus networking that we, that we do today. Will it be as good? I don't think so. Will it, could it be good enough? Yeah. And, and I, if I remember correctly, Clay Christensen said something about that concept. Thanks. Um, David, you were, I saw you unmute and then I think Avi is next in the queue. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, you were talking about Harvard and Princeton, and we can throw in Yale and CMU, but if yeah, I remember rightly, CMU, but go ahead. if I remember <laughs> rightly, most of the students' higher education access in the U.S. is like through community colleges. Yeah. And there's a huge, long tail or bulk of students that are there. And, you know, that's a different experience. And what comes to mind is what, you know, Southern New Hampshire yeah. is doing. You know, they're at 135,000 participants. And the last I heard from Paula Plank, 
you know, he said that they're hitting now non-traditional full undergrad degree people who are, you know, 28 to 35 with families who are actually completing degrees. So I feel like that's just a whole nother world that we never talk about. And I was just wondering what your take is on, on that space. What do, and, and so tri trivia, not trivia question, um, uh, pop quiz. Um, do you know where, pop, where Paul LeBlanc was president before he joined Southern New Hampshire University? I forget, somewhere, somewhere more mainstream. Marlboro College. Um, oh. And this, this, this goes back to Chris's objection, as gently as I possibly can. Um, one of the stories we're developing in the book is that before Paul LeBlanc went to Southern New Hampshire, he was the president of Marlboro College. He went to Marlboro College, uh, you know, he, he, went, he went to the Board of Regents and said, we need to aggressively go online with our offerings. Um, and the Board of Regents says this is fundamentally opposed to the way we do business here. It's going to damage our ability to reach students. Don't do it. Um, Paul LeBlanc left Marlboro and went to Southern New Hampshire, which you rightly say has 135,000 students today and projects 220,000 in the next couple of years, if I remember correctly. Marlboro College went out of business last year, um, shut, shut their doors. Uh, I don't know what to do with that example, but I think it's interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I actually, mean the, other, the other thing they're pushing on too is the, you know, they are, I think, a year away from a $10,000 four-year undergrad. Yeah, that's, that's the scary thing, right? And again, this, this, is, this is a page out of Clay Christensen. Um, is it as good as what you can get on campus? Probably not. Is it good enough for a lower price? Yeah. Will it get better over time? I think so. Um, mm -hmm. So, th so that, yeah, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry, Avi was next in the queue, then Mike. Uh, Mark, a few quick comments. I, I really like yeah, yeah. Mark. Yeah. I, I do not look at online education as a substitute, but rather as a complement, okay? Okay. Uh, we have done it in Rochester for the last five years, and a lot of the so-called recitation we put online instead of making students come at night, and they loved it. So they had the socialization, connection, uh, job search, preparation during the day. But at night, many of them, for various reasons, prefer to be home or with friends. And a lot of the recitation was done uh, online. And because it's recorded and so on, it, could, it helped us. Second, there's the argument, the classic argument of Sherwin Rosen, uh, AR 1981, of the economy of the superstars. And clearly, high-end university will uh, try to cast a big net with online education. But question is resources. Are faculty interested in that? Faculty also worry that people will steal the content. So it's a little bit more uh, complicated. But the big issue is... Toby, I'm going to try to mute you. OK. Uh, the big issue is that... Hello? There, there we go. OK. The big issue that American universities suffer from is out of 100 students who start undergraduate study, maybe 50 of them graduate five years or six years later. So there's a huge dropout on, on campuses. So it's not only that the online suffer from attrition, but also the physical university with all the major resources also deal with it. And we've done some research on it the last two years. The number one predictor of staying on campus and graduating is your social connection. Nothing to do with SAT, zip code, et cetera. It's how many friends you have on campus. Yeah. Those friends can carry you over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I don't, I don't know if that, you know, are you saying that is a, so you're saying these two, these two things are complements, not substitutes that they serve two different markets? Is that, is that what you're saying? To a large degree, we can look at them at a uh, substitute. I can be in small town America. I would like to get an MBA, and I either move to a big city or I take an online program. Or I would like to learn the latest in Python programming, and I don't feel like joining a university, so that'd be uh, something interesting for me. Or just to learn about Greek history. Okay. Right, right. So, there are, there's a lot of elements in there that will break it out in different ways. 
Yeah. Like cool. second degrees people in the 50s say, you know what, I would like to slow down and take some uh, humanities classes, okay? That, that's the one that I find most interesting, right, is the underserved market, the people who need training, they need it fast, and they, and they don't have time to take 18 months off their life and come to Carnegie Mellon's campus. Um, uh, you know, the, again, page out of Clay Christensen um, uh, that, you know, is, are there people who are going to grow up to serve that market, and will that product become good enough that it starts to cannibalize our, our uh our business model. Um, Mike, you're next in the queue. Uh, so this is all super interesting. And it does seem like there's a big underserved market, which would be, I guess, complementary to some of the stuff going on. Um, the other question that I had was I'm trying to think about how all of this fits together. So if you think about the roles that universities play um, and kind of the education component, putting aside the research uh, missions. Uh, students come for signaling, they come to learn from the content from faculty, and they learn from peers. And I think kind of questions about each of these have come up throughout the talk. But I'm trying to think about all of this put together. And should we imagine kind of the new models to try to uh, bundle all of these, the way that this is kind of bundled within a university? Or you could imagine Kaggles may be good for signaling and kind of this group with uh, PMs is going to be good for peers and Coursera is going to be good for content. So like, what is the, what is the vision around the way those three things come together? I, I could imagine it happening e either way, but I, I'm, I'm, I think it's more natural to imagine it become un unbundled and, and to have it, you know, the people who are really good at networks, provide the networking component, the people who are really good at certification provide the certification component, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, we're, we're talking to, well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I can imagine it being, I can imagine it either way, but I think it's more likely to be unbundled. Um, let, me, let me say one more provocative thing um, about what should universities do to respond. Um, and here, what I'll argue is the transformation I saw in the entertainment industry was the industry leaders initially saw technology correctly as a threat to their way of doing business. And at some point, when they saw Netflix and Amazon and Google making great content, they actually took a step back and said, you know what, my, my mission as an industry is not to sell DVDs. It's to create great content and get that content in front of an audience. Technology actually gives me the opportunity to fulfill that mission better than what I could before. Um, I actually remember having a conversation with a pretty senior creative guy at one of the studios whose, pro, whose show, one of the shows he, he had in his portfolio got sold to Netflix. And he said, you know, confidentially, when I watch the season that's showing on Netflix now, it is both artistically better and creatively better than what we were doing. You know, that like the, the, the cinematics, the storytelling, it's better than what we were doing. And it was a real puzzle to him. Um, would it be possible for us in higher education to make a similar transformation? Would it be possible for us to say, I think technology is a genuine threat to our way of doing business? I wonder whether, though, it could be an enabling force to our mission. Um, and just for fun, I had my research assistant pull the mission statements for the top 10 universities and the mission statements for the top 10 brands. Um, university mission statements average 87 words. And, and just so I don't pick on anybody, uh, in particular, I'll put up a random university's mission statement. Um, if you read through them, they make absolutely no sense. <laughs> it, it reads almost like they were created by committee over time with no editorial responsibility. And I think that's because they were created by committees over time with no editorial uh, in, input. Um, you compare that to the top 10 brands and their mission statements average 30 words, and typically they're pretty darn clear. Um, so this is Google, our mission is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and, and useful. That's a clear, actionable mission statement. Um, then the next thing I had to do was pull the 
uh, the, the mission statements for the top 10 online education platforms, and theirs came in at 23 words um, and included things like Khan Academy. Our mission is to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Um, the other thing that, that she noted um, without me asking her is when she looked at the mission statements of universities, the only two universities who mentioned anything about the needs of individual students were Western Governors University and Southern New Hampshire University, the two largest online um, uh, providers, were the only university mission statements who mentioned anything about individual students. Um, what's our mission statement? Like, you know, uh, and, and again, in, in the Atlantic piece, what I proposed is a mission that says, we strive to create opportunities for as many students as possible to discover and develop their unique talents and to use those talents to make a difference in the world. Um, I think if that's our mission statement, um, I think we actually could use technology to do a better job of creating that mission than the technology we've, we've got today. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the high level pitch. The other thing is, I think this opens up a whole world of questions for academic researchers to play around with, right? Using the data to measure the outcomes of, of interest and how those, how those uh, outcomes change over time in different, in different settings. This, this should be right stinking up our alley to, to do. So let me, let me pause there. Maybe I should have paused before the, before the does, does the mission statement, and, and by the way, HBS's mission is uh, 10 words. We educate leaders who make a difference in the world. So just, just to be clear, I'm not dissing any of, any of you. Um, I gave a talk last week at a university who will go nameless. Their mission statement was 453 words. I kid you not. Um, anyway, so does... Does the, does, the, does the model mission narrative seem right? Well, I, actually, I was going to remark on this, Mike, that I think is a little unfair. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, 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 I enjoyed the point. But it's, it's exactly, uh, univer if you're going to find the missions, it's not going to be at the university. The, you know, the university's purpose is to settle parking disputes between faculty and students. <laughs> Uh, it, the, you know, uh, <laughs> That's not a particularly compelling mission statement. <laughs> the, the missions are quite often at the at the school levels in most universities that you can find, and and you can quite often find them very explicit, as you do say at Harvard Business School. Is also true. My former employer before coming here also the mission statement really wasn't at the university level; it was at the business school level. And then if you went over to the engineering school, they had a very different mission and they were pretty explicit about it. And I mean, I don't know this university well enough yet to be able to say that, but I, you know, I, of the universities I know well, as you move between schools, you do find really very different missions. The, and then the other, that, that, that's one thing. And then I would, I would also push back in a slightly different way on this focusing on missions. Okay. Yeah. Most of the universities I've ever paid attention to, and I'm, I, I, it, I'm gonna admit up front, there's gotta be, this can't characterize everything, <laughs> okay? But um, the, the, you know, where I've spent most of my time, their basic operational model is to cover costs in the short run <laughs> and generate donations in the long run. And, and so the thing, you know, so they generate loyalty that pays off at a very, at a, at a, at a, at a really long time horizon. And so when I think about missions, you know, this isn't, again. You can't tuck that neatly to a university mission statement. We create loyalty to, to leverage donations over the long term. But that the mission doesn't really capture operationally what's, that you know happening and and in particular the when i think about the threats you've identified uh the operational model of, of many sub departments within universities is still going to be the same we got to cover the cost generate a set of 
you know, very loyal student body, and uh, we hope donations help us down the road. That's that's a, if I, you know, I'm overstating the case, but I want to overstate it in order to be provocative. I think you know, and I. I was actually talking to, well, uh, yeah, this is being recorded. Never mind. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday about this very, about this very idea, right? Um, why do people give universities so much money? Because, because, of, because of the connection, I will grant you, but I think also because of our reputation in the world, right? This is why people give us big multi-million dollar gifts to put their name on the side of buildings. Um, well, there is it, that. Yes, What's and there's that? a magic that happens at universities. I, you know, I have to confess, I'm still a believer in the magic. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, as a, I don't think of myself as a magician, but I do know that magic happens in the classroom, and I've seen it from time to time, and it's a yeah, yeah. privilege to take part in that. So that magic does generate a real honest connection in a way that's different than, yeah. So I would... I would go back to one of my very favorite cases of all time. It's, it's, the, it's the Encyclopedia Britannica case. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> and, and, the, like, and, and I'd, lo I'd love your feedback on this, right? When I teach that case, what I try to leave hanging out in the classroom is the question of what the heck could Britannica have done? <laughs> you know, what right. could they have done differently? And, and I always try to come back to, you know, what was Britannica's mission? You and I have talked about this, actually. Right. right. Their mission wasn't to sell books. Their mission was actually to get in. You know, I would argue their mission was actually to get information out widely in the world. Was technology a threat to their model? Yeah. Was it a threat to their mission? I don't think so. Um, the other interesting thing about Britannica is, as you well know, just how poorly suited their existing assets were to the new way of, right. of competing. Right. That they had this very slow, very staid editorial process that made perfect sense when you were printing information on books that couldn't be changed, but didn't make any sense at all when you were doing the, you know, when you were, when you were printing encyclopedias and all of a sudden Encarta was faster at them at, at moving. I, I talked to a friend last night who, um, you know, was, well, anyway, she had opinions on this, but, but what, what she was saying was that when she talks to um, industry researchers, what they say is we, we don't do research with universities because of the intellectual property. We do it with, because of the connection with great students. Um, that if we had an important research question, we'd do it in-house, we wouldn't outsource it. So, so I, I don't want to monopolize, but I'm gonna have one mild pushback. Go for uh, it. And then I'll let other people talk. I, I never really thought about the Britannica case in terms of missions the way we're talking about it right now. And if I, and off the top of my head, if I had to recharacterize it, I would say one of the issues they faced was a misalignment of missions, that the content side of that organization did have the mission you, you characterized correctly as wanting to assemble the world's information in the most authoritative manner and, and, and uh, produce and deploy it uh, and archive it. Okay. And the, the sales division at some level had a different mission, which was to put you know, food on the table of the sales force and put the books on the shelves of their customers. And the and sales it, force was very powerful. And the sales force is very powerful. And, that, and, those, and the two divisions had an aligned mission most of the time, but not when this, right? they, but they shared a brand and when not, not during this crisis. Uh, and that, I mean, I hadn't really th thought of characterizing it that way. So, I, 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 but I, in the same sense that universities in practice have multiple missions at multiple divisions, I, I, I want to worry a little bit about that uh, in practice. I could sell that as a bug, not a feature. <laughs> okay, I've said enough. I have to think about it, though. I, so, let me, so I could go on about the research, but, but I was told to stop at 1 o'clock and leave time for questions. So let me stop now. <laughs> Mike. 
Professor Smith. Thanks, Mike. Uh, very interesting. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate a lot of the connections between what went, went on in these different entertainment industries and what's taking place right now in our education industry. And my question, I'm trying to think through, and I, I may not be able to phrase this extremely well, but um, I'm trying to think about the future and a couple of different future scenarios that you were just talking about. Starting from the fact that, you know, we made a lot of comparisons today between, you know, six studios in the world and they didn't keep up. Now, of course, there's not just six universities in the world, right? There's many more than that. So we're starting at a different place. Mm -hmm. And there's two, I think, things about the future that we agree on, one of, of which is there's an increasing demand, and the past is probably also a good predictor of the future. There's going to be a lot of demand for variety in educational services. That's one reason why we have so many different institutions in the world, not even counting the things that go on in corporations for reskilling and learning and so forth that have been around for generations. And I'm trying to tie that to the kinds of comments that you were making with respect to, you know, some percentage of the universities are going to disappear in the future. Are we really talking about a push toward consolidation. I mean, some of these universities, their finances haven't been very good to begin with. And that whole range in there, what are we really talking about as the future from a business perspective? Because I think from an educational perspective, we have, it, this is, a, as you've said, golden age for education. We're going to need more of it for more people. Yeah. Yeah. How is that going to happen? I, you know, I, I really haven't worked out the, the future business model. I, I can imagine a world where superstar professors go to big platforms and get their ideas out there widely. Um, you know, I can imagine an unbundled world where superstar professors, you've got superstar professors educating um, in kind of the masterclass outlier mode, and you've got online networks doing the networking and you've got credentialing agencies, whether they be professional credentialing agencies or informal like Kaggle, or, um, you know, I, 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 well, I can imagine them. The, the one that I think is most interesting is employers vertically integrating into our space. Um, my son did, a, um, a, did an internship at SAP and SAP has their own sales school. And apparently it's incredibly selective. And if you get in, you're more or less guaranteed an account executive position at SAP when, when you come out. Um, you know, would it make sense for universities to vertically integrate into our, into our space to provide a much more customized education um, on, you know, on the things that they, they specifically need? Uh, I don't. I don't know what this is going to look like, but but I, I think it's. I, I'm having fun thinking about it, and I'd love anybody's thoughts. I told Shane earlier, if you wake up at two in the morning and think Mike Mike's full of crap, I want to be the first person you email to tell me why. Um, well, certainly there is more more inter, more discussion of integration between corporations and inst educational institutions today than there was in the past. Yeah, Maybe being derided by some people, but still. Well, and that's that's the other interesting thing. Like this didn't come up in the mission discussion, but I, I think you know one one pushback on the mission discussion is we've lost our mission as a university. Our mission is to create. Is, our mission is to deliver a liberal arts education um, to 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 people, and I think. Maybe we do rediscover that mission, but I think what we're going to rediscover, what we're going to discover, is the market for people interested in a four-year liberal arts education is not big enough to support five thousand colleges and universities. Um, again, I'm quite sure Harvard will be just fine. This is how most of my classes end with stunned silence. Um, well, we, we are one minute away from the, the bewitching hour anyway, so perhaps we could give you a hand clap and those who want to hang for a little bit to, to chat and hang in.